It's only done a few minutes, right? Mm -hmm. We have three people. All right, we'll get started in a few minutes. Thanks for joining so far. Um, sure, you can start. There's only three people. What time is it? 7.32. Let's give it two more minutes. All right, we'll give it two more minutes is what I'm being told by my director. Oh, there comes oh. another person. I thought. Oh, Say hi to Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Joe. How you doing? He's on mute, but he said, "How you doing?" Very good. Oh. oh. Hmm. Am I on mute, or not, do you hear me? I can't hear him. Hmm? I think he's talking to you. I can't hear him. Oh, do you hear me? Oh, you know what? Is your computer on volume? Probably not. I don't keep my volume on. That's why you can't hear him. Oops. No. You, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I won't talk, but but I won't watch TV. <laughs> What'd you do? Is that good? Mm -hmm. I mean, I shouldn't have the volume on, right? Sounds like you're getting some kind of feedback. Yeah, turn Yeah, I'm going to turn my volume off. I never use Okay. It. Oh, because you probably have volume somewhere else. Yeah, it's coming from the cameras, I believe. All right. Let's get started. Uh, I'm Joe. This is a 718 Cyclery here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we're a one-person shop. We do a lot of trips and camping. Um, today I'm joined by my director, mm -hmm. my wife Deb, just off camera. If you have any questions uh, while we're doing this, uh, use the chat all feature because it, if you chat to me, I'm not going to see it because I'm not close to the camera. My eyes aren't that good. So answering or asking questions via the chat all feature, we'll get it into my director here, producer. And then chat everyone chat everyone. We'll get into that and then um, I'll be able to answer questions. Um, so this is our third episode and each episode we try to technically push the boundaries of Zoom uh, as, as I know it. So today we're going to do multiple cameras and I'm going to share a screen because I have a presentation I'm going to show. Um, so um, the shop um, as it exists has been around since 2008. Um, in about 2013-2014 what started happening in the shop with the employees that we had at the time was that uh, we had a lot of folks that were doing their own camping trips on their own, on the weekends and their time off. Little by little, that group grew bigger and bigger. Eventually, they invited me along. And eventually, we started taking customers along. And it grew and grew really in parallel with the whole um, kind of the adventure cycling kind of genre or craze in the bike industry that kind of started the last four or five years. So we stumbled into it only because we had employees that were really into it. We had brands and relationships that were really kind of starting to push into that world. So for us, it was really easy. What we started doing is we started doing what we called micro tours. And micro tours were a trip where we left on a Saturday, came back on a Sunday. We did those once a month during warmer weather. And we would take 30 to 40 people and travel 40 to 60 miles, camp, and then come back, leaving from New York City. Um, wildly successful, the program grew and grew and grew. Uh, this year we didn't do any of those trips because of the COVID stuff. Um, hopefully next year we're trying to figure out a way to do these things really safe. Um, so what I'm going to do is I, I came up, I have a presentation. Um, you know, it's uh, looking at screen on Zoom, which is not the funnest thing in the world. But I'll zip through it, you know, rather quick. And I think it's a, it does a decent job of kind of outlining 
um, some of the ideas about different kinds of bikes, different kinds of trips, different kinds of bags, different ways to put those bags on the bike, uh, some trip planning tools that I use, and then some packing tools that I use. And we're not going to talk about what's in, what's in the bag or what do I pack or what does my first aid kit look like. We'll do that in the future. This is more of an overview. All right, so that being said, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and see what, looks, what happens. And I'll go through this quick. I don't want to bore everyone to death. Let's see, share screen. All right. Now my hope is everyone sees this presentation and not me on the screen. Is that right, Deb? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it's intro to bike it's touring. loading. Okay. Um, you. you know, a lot of yeah. a lot of terminology. Uh, either by camping, by packing, by touring. Uh, I think by touring is a good, decent overview, and we'll get into what some of the differences are. Um, so this is the presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about different kinds of bikes, different kinds of uh, trips, uh, different ways to carry gear, uh, gear itself, trip planning resources and local trips. So on the screen here, you see this is a group we took last, uh, I believe this was last fall. Um, this was a trip of about 40 or 50 miles. And the trips that we do certainly are geared towards beginners in that um, we kind of try to lower the bar for entry. And that means orientation classes, making everyone feel really comfortable about the trip, um, about the people that are going on the trip, we do have some people that use the trip as a shakedown for bigger trips in the summer. Um, but it's, it's a great, I'm going to knock on wood here. It's just been a great, great group over the years. We've done 40 to 50 of these and um, haven't had any major issues. A lot of, you know, there's crashes, there's mishaps, there's rain, there's lightning, there's animals, uh, all kinds of those kinds of things. But in the end, um, I definitely look back with a smile on my face on all these trips. All right. The bike. So, um, let me, since I have all these video people, yeah, in the way. Them. All right, I'm moving the video out of the way here. <clears throat> so, you know, we get a lot of folks that come into the shop, and we're here in Brooklyn, um, that ask for a touring bike. I want a touring bike. And, and what I usually like to ask them is kind of what, what they mean by that. You know, what, what, is this a bike that we're going to go across the country with? Is this the bike that I want to use on the weekends, but I also want to commute during the day? So I try to get to the essence of what they mean, because in my mind, like a classic touring bike has the following features, um, a triple chain ring in the front, meaning that there's three chain rings in the front of, you know, where the crank is, um, which leads to a large gear range, right? Very, from very, very easy to very, very hard. That's kind of one of the ideas about a touring bike is a very wide gear range. Um, it could have disc or rim brakes, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Bar end shifters, meaning the shifters are on the end of the handlebars. Those are designed uh, to work really well with touring drivetrains, but also they're very easy to maintain and very easy to fix. Um, touring bikes have a long wheelbase, meaning that the wheels are farther, as far as part as possible on, uh, on this type of bike. And that leads to like a nice, long, comfortable, straight ride. Um, has the ability to mount racks and fenders. I would hope so. Um, the wheel size, 700C or 26. 26-inch 26 wheels are um, kind of probably the most common wheel size on the planet. So the idea is that there are still touring bikes that are made with 26-inch wheels with the idea that if you're caught in the middle of absolutely nowhere, you're going to be able to find replacement parts. Now, I think um, over the years, that's kind of drifted away a little bit, but there are still, like Surly still makes a 26-inch touring bike. Uh, and these bikes are great for long distances or long road tours. A light touring bike, and this is a bike we see a lot here in New York City, um, and, and that being the one bike that does a lot of things for a lot of folks. So it has two chain rings in the front and not three, um, meaning that the, the range isn't as wide as a touring bike, but there's, more, there's some more functionality to it, um, being able to, again, uh, do a lot of things for someone. If a person comes to us and wants to um, go on long trips, they want to commute to work, they want to ride around the park to do fitness laps, they want to go to the beach, they want to um, run errands in the weekend. These kind of bikes become the jack of all trade. Um, a little lighter than a touring bike, uh, usually has 700C wheels, integrated shifters, meaning the shifters are going to be up at the, uh, where the brake levers are. Um, a little more sportier, you know, um, 
I use quotes around that term, uh, only because, uh, you know, the wheelbase starts to get closer together and that makes the bike a little more lively or a little more kind of um, a little more fun to ride. I was, the analogy is, um, you know, a, a touring bike is kind of like an RV, you know, certainly versus, um, you know, something a little less cumbersome than an RV. <laughs> An adventure bike, and this is kind of a, a, um, a general um, term, and more of a marketing term in a lot of ways, but this is going to be your bike for bike packing. So bigger tires, generally has a single front chain ring, uh, generally has disc brakes. The wheel size is going to be a more of a mountain bike wheel size, which is 27.5 or 29er. There's a lot of frame mounts. You can mount stuff all over this bike. Generally going to be a flat bar, generally going to have very wide gear range and great for off-road and multi-surface tours. Bikes uh, like this include the Salsa Fargo, um, the Surly, um, kind of most of Surly's bikes, the Ogre, the Troll, uh, the ECR, those kinds of things. Uh, gravel bike. <clears throat> gravel bikes are bikes that have, um, it's kind of a new, uh, new slash old um, genre in cycling that's come around the last three or four years. Um, these bikes are also pretty popular. You're going to see bigger tires in these bikes, a pretty wide gear range. Um, <clears throat> mostly disc brakes, um, generally a little more overbuilt than a typical road bike in that it's a little more solid to um, have bigger tires and kind of deal with rougher roads and does have a wide gear range. So kind of similar in a lot of ways to a light touring bike and there's some blurriness with that, but a, a lot of it's marketing. So it's kind of want to get those terms out there. Um, there isn't there isn't a definite line where a light touring bike ends and a gravel bike begins. And then finally, any bike that has a rack on the back, right? This is a, this is a trip we went on. When people come in and do our trips, we you know I try to counsel them that they don't need a thirty five hundred dollar touring bike to do this. Let's do this with the bike you have. Let's get a rack. Let's throw some panniers in the back. And for the trips that we do, the overnights at least, certainly you can get away with that. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, different types of tours, um, different types of tours, and we'll go through this pretty quick. Uh, Self-supported tour, and this is uh, a long, a longer trip in duration. Uh, everything you need is with you, um, so you need self-sufficiency in a few areas: uh, mechanically, first aid, nutrition, um, understanding rest, <clears throat> being able to manage all those things. And generally, if it's on the road, you're going to see a rack and pannier system like these wonderful folks that you see on this trip. This is our Adirondack trip. We do this every year. We do a week in the Adirondacks. That's the trip you're seeing on the screen. A supported tour. Um, this is when there's a van that kind of follows you around. Um, and there's some nice things about this. I've never done one. Um, the bikes are loaded or the bikes can be loaded, but usually what you have in your bike is kind of what you need for the day. Maybe a rain jacket, maybe some food. Um, but it allows, you know, kind of the heavy lifting to be done by a, a support vehicle. Um, and again, there's the peace of mind of a support vehicle with its um, mechanical capabilities, first aid, um, you know, kind of a safety net in a lot of ways. Um, food, sleep, mechanical and first aid things are taken care of. So this is something that you see a lot of. A lot of companies out there do this. They provide these packaged um, trips and tours. And they're great. I've never been on one. We have a lot of customers that do them. Nothing against it. Um, I'm sure as I get older, I'll want to do more and more of those. <laughs> Um, bike packing, and this is kind of a general term too. This is a more of an off-road tour. Um, you're going to see adventure bikes. You're going to see frame bags. This is a trip we did to Vermont in 2014 or 15. I forget. I think it was 14. Um, in the background there, but you'll see everything is flat bar. Everything is big tires. Um, the roads a gravel road. <clears throat> That's kind of the way we were going. Uh, in to in, which is um, similar to uh, supported. And this is also called credit card touring, where you're, you know, kind of uh, bopping from, you know, from bed and breakfast to bed and breakfast. Maybe your stuff is getting, uh, sh you know, shuttled ahead. Maybe you are um, traveling with things, but, you know, you don't have to travel with when you do an end-to-end -end trip and there's no support vehicle. You know, you don't have to travel with a tent. You don't have to travel with a cooking kit. So it kind of lightens the load in a lot of ways and also gives you um, just this, the security of knowing you'll have a warm shower at night and a nice bed and some good food. So you see this a lot in Europe uh, where distances are a little closer um, and the, the road net where the, the cycling networks there are a little more built in for that kind of thing. I've never done one of those either. I've heard about it, but um, haven't been able to do one of those yet either. 
And then micro tours, which are also called sub 24s. Um, micro tour is a name that we just made up. Um, anyone can use it. Uh, it's self-supported. It leaves on a Saturday, returns on a Sunday. And these are again, leaving from New York City. They're low barrier for entry and an inclusive trip. <clears throat> Excuse me, we used to call them unsupported, but I felt that that term was kind of negative and kind of um, had connotations of you're here on your own. So we say self-supported now. And self-supported in the trips that we do, you know, we, you know, for instance, we, you know, ask that everyone bring a tube, right? Everyone bring some tools. Not that you need to know how to use them because we have support and uh, in riders that are going to help out, you know, if you get a flat tire, but um, we just don't want to carry tubes all day. And, you know, first aid, we want to make sure everyone has their own first aid situations. You know, we certainly as, as leaders of the trip have bigger first aid situations. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure everyone gets there safe and feels comfortable that there's a safety net in terms of supporting them all the way. We've done, uh, I, it's about to be at least 50 of these things. The only time that someone ever didn't make it was me. I got sick on a trip once, maybe three years ago, and I couldn't, I couldn't get through the trip. So my employees at the time uh, heroically kind of took it over and everything. They had a great time without me. All right. So we're going to talk about how to put gear on bikes and different methodologies here. Um, so this is a very common situation. This is a rack and pannier situation where you're putting <clears throat> racks in the front and the rear of the bike, you're usually starting on the rear then adding the front. Um, it's pretty high capacity. Um, you're dealing with, um, you know, bags that are anywhere from 16 liters to 24 liters of bag. Um, and, you know, having you know, two or four of them, you can see how that volume kind of adds up. It's very easy to set up. Uh, they're very common, um, very common to get them installed, very common to, you know, racks fit on bikes very easily, bags fit on racks very easily, those kinds of things. Very easy to organize your stuff, you know. In my left pannier is my food, in my right pannier is my clothing and tools, that kind of thing. Frame bags. So frame bags um, kind of force you to down a minimalist kind of path, right? I always tell the story or the an anecdote that when you have panniers, you kind of use as much space as you have. It's like wedding planning. If you have three weeks to plan a wedding, or two years to plan a wedding. You're gonna take up all the time you have. So usually when you have panniers, you tend to fill them up with stuff you might not need. Um, with uh, frame bags, you just don't have that luxury. You have to really think about what it is you're bringing. Um, one of the nice things is uh, the weight is on the center line of the bike, as opposed to a rack and pannier system where the bags are kind of a little more outboard. This kind of really puts a lot of the weight down the center line of the bike, which is a good thing for stability. Um, reduced weight because now you don't have to carry, you know, when you do rack and panniers, you, you have a pannier, you have a rack, which weighs something. You have bags that weigh something and the stuff that goes in the bags, right? So reducing that, you're kind of taking the racks out of the equation in a lot of ways. Um, and also reduced mechanical complications. I've been on a lot of trips and tours where, you know, people's racks weren't really up to the challenge of what they loaded on those racks and racks fall off and Racks can fall off and cause injury. Racks can cough and fall off and cause damage to your bike. Racks don't usually fall off without neither doing one of those two. Um, and it's a mess because now you're in the middle of nowhere. The trip is stopped. Someone has a rack and all their stuff is across the highway like a yard sale. And you got to figure out how to get that person's rack reinstalled or how to like spread their clothing and all their stuff out amongst everyone else because they don't have a rack anymore. So it's kind of fun. It's not the worst thing. Frame bags. Uh, here's a real quick um, idea about um, volumes, right? So you can see that on the pannier side, you're dealing with generally, if you know, if you have 48 liters in the back and 32 in the front, you get to 80 pretty quick. Um, on frame bags, you're dealing with much less volume, and that's a that's a bag, that's a bike that has bags like everywhere, and you're still at 40. You know, you're almost a little more than half of your capacity. So you really have to kind of think about using frame bags. They tend to be a little more expensive. You know, I always think about, um, you know, frame bags or, or bags on bikes with the equation of um, dollars per volume. You know, how many liters am I getting per dollar? And you can kind of compare different packing situations by doing that equation. So. Um, this is a hybrid gear. This is a hybrid setup, meaning that this is a setup where it's kind of mixed. And these are two situations that I've used over the years. I try to mix it up a lot. I try to use different bikes. I try to use different setups different bags, just all kinds of things, just throwing things out there. So you'll see on the left <clears throat> is a trip to, hold on, 
videos over that. So that's panniers in the back and frame bags in the front for that guy. And that was a Catskill trip we did for a week up in the Catskills. The green bike on the right is, um, you know, kind of a, a, a hanging bag off the back saddle and then a front bag on a rack. Not a great setup. It was very heavy, um, very kind of, I felt inefficient, but I, I kind of wanted to give it a try. So that's the situation with that. And that was just for an overnight. But that, you know, for instance, on the green bike, the rack is very heavy. That bag is very heavy. So you're adding like a, a factor to some of the things that you're already carrying with you. You're kind of carrying more weight than you need to, I, I felt in this situation. All right, so in terms of gear and taking gear, what I, when people come in and, and wanna, want us to help plan a trip with them or have some questions about going on a trip, and we encourage folks to come in all the time and ask us questions. My big two questions are, where are you, where are you sleeping and how are you eating? Um, because if the question is, where are you sleeping, and the answer is at a hotel every night, well, that's great, because now you don't have to deal with a tent and a sleeping bag and a sleeping pad. And how are you eating? You know, certainly if it's like, a, a, if it's a trip that there's a, um, a support vehicle following you, fantastic. If it's a trip in an area where you're going to be able to get food in the morning and then you're stopping at night at, you know, at a restaurant before you go to a hotel, that's cool too. But if it's the inverse of that, if you're sleeping out in the woods and if you're making all your own food, you have to really think about what you're packing. And I always ask these questions because the tent sleeping bag and the sleeping pad, those three items are just the bulkiest things to carry, but generally the biggest and bulkiest things to put on your bike. So if you're in a situation that requires that, well, we need to plan for that in terms of how it's gonna get on your bike. Um, if not, well, then we don't have to. Um, but you know, with the food thing too, I always tell people, you know, there's, there's emergency situations, don't assume that you're gonna find food all the way, you know, maybe bring bars and all those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, the big things are where are you sleeping and how are you eating? Those are the questions you really have to answer um, yourself. Um, in terms of gear and what I pack, um, I use um, a tool that was developed in the 30s in Seattle by a group. I think it's like the Seattle Mountain, Mountain Climbers or Mountaineers. I forget the name technically. <clears throat> it was an outdoors group or it is an outdoors group that devised um, an organizational chart that talked about the things you need to travel with when you're going in the backcountry is what they how they described it, and certainly those things have changed over the years. Where in the 30s they were talking about compasses, and now it's a GPS device. But the categories are also very valid, and I use these as a checklist when I pack, and we also use these as a tool when newer riders are going on trips with us, just to kind of, um, you know, kind of cover the basics in a lot of ways. And I'll go through this super quick because we can all read this. Uh, navigation, it's maps, compass, GPS. The big thing I will stop here and say, you know, I always tell folks, don't rely on your phone, don't rely on your GPS, have printed cue sheets or printed maps with you. Just have something with you because your phone could die. Um, all kinds of things can happen with electronics. Um, waterproof, you know, kind of store your maps in a waterproof situation so you always have something. And what we even started doing is that, you know, I did notice that a lot of folks that go on our trips don't print out the maps because they're going with their friends and their friends know where they're going. And we've had people get lost and it's really disruptive when people get lost um, from, it's dangerous, but it's also very disruptive to like, have to double back and try to figure out where everyone is, right? Because the whole trip has to kind of lurch to a stop. Um, so um, what we started doing is actually, I, I created like this almost like a cartoon map that I give out to everyone. It looks like the back of a map of, at like a, like a kid's restaurant like a treasure map it's super simplified i give it to everyone on the trip just so they can you know really in, in real general sense understand where they are so that's the navigation side of it sun protection yeah insulation yes illumination yes first aid i get it fire get it with fire i always like to take three ways to start a fire i don't know why but i do that's like a lighter waterproof matches and maybe like some cool little flint tool that i want to mess with but always have i always have three ways when you go on a trip with 40 people and everyone has two ways to start a, start a fire, that's a lot of fire. Um, uh, repair and toolkits, um, that's saved to a different episode. Um, nutrition, food, hydration, water, emergency shelter. <clears throat> you know, on our overnight trips, that becomes a little, you know, we always joke that, you know, on the East Coast where we do our trips, you know, you're never more than 50 yards from civilization, right? You know, how, how, how remote can you possibly get, you know, within 60 miles of New York City? 
you can get pretty remote actually. Um, so what I what I do here is I I pack a, uh, like a survival blanket. We've actually used those with folks. Um, you know those foil blankets that they give you when you uh, race the marathon, those kinds of things. So that's kind of the emergency stuff that I'll bring on the emergency sensor side. But it's a great. You should look it up. It's a really great. Um, if you look it up, it's called the Ten Essentials, and you'll look it up. It's a great way to organize your gear. Um, this is a packing list, and this is a partial packing list. What I do um, when I get ready for a trip is that I'll on Google Docs, I'll, I'll everything that goes in my bag, I'll list and I'll weigh. Now, the the weighing thing, I'm not a weight weenie. I'm not a person that cares about grams. I'm not shaving down the matchsticks to make them lighter. I just do it so that it's a reference for folks to look at. It's a reference for, you know, about three weeks before a trip, I'll kind of, you know, get everything more or less squared away and kind of get this published on our website. So this way newer folks can kind of start to understand, oh, you know, this is what I need to take, or that's what Joe's taken, or that's what, you know, whoever's taken, just to get a rough idea about the, the totality of what you might need to bring. And that's all it is. Um, <clears throat> And, I, and I've saved these over the years, and it's, it's interesting to see the weights of things. And when you really get into like the minutia of you weigh the bike, and then you weigh the bags, and then you put stuff in the bag. And um, the people, there are people that really get into the weight side of it, which is why I kind of do it. I'm kind of playing to them. Um, but it is nice to kind of see the comparisons and like, oh my God, that bike was like a third heavier than the trip I did before. That's why it took me forever and I was exhausted. But um, yeah, you know, I'm not that into weight. Uh, safety, this is kind of touching on what I described earlier where there's paper maps and um, <clears throat> what are called cue sheets. And cue sheets are kind of a real cryptic way to kind of uh, get directions on a bike. A cue sheet, kind of can't really see it here, but it's this white piece of paper. A lot of the software that, 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 that you'll use to plan your trip, if you're you know, doing a map on a computer screen, will print out a format called a cue sheet. And a cue sheet is a piece of paper, eight and a half by 11, that's made to be folded down into quarters. And on this, and many bags have a little sleeve that you put this folded down piece of paper in. And it basically just gives you a turn by turn, you know, um, on a piece of paper. It'll say, you know, you're on Main Street, four miles, make a left. The next, you know, then you're on Smith Street, you know, eight miles, take a right. So it's just like an analog way to kind of uh, take a map and turn it into turn by turn directions. And this is a technique that's been used for, you know, for generations to kind of travel on a bike. Um, we make these available on all of our trips. I print them out, even though I, I know damn well where I'm going generally, I'll always have a copy to give to somebody just in case, you know, they need a copy and they want to, to study it. So cue sheets. Um, and also maps, you'll see I have all the maps and, you know, as many maps as I can carry. Um, on the right, you'll see that's my first aid kit for a, a bigger trip. Um, so there's a lot going on there. We all got wilderness first aid training last year. And basically it really freaked me out a lot in terms of like what I didn't know and what could possibly happen. Um, so not shown over here also, I, I carry a splint too with you tourniquets. You know, a lot of the injuries that people will get on a trip like this is gonna be a broken collarbone, broken wrist, you know, fall, you know, the things that happen when you fall off your bike. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some things happen over the years, knock on wood, everyone's survived, you know, um, uh, um, all kinds of, you know, mishaps with gear. A lot of it's gear falling off the bike and kind of getting caught in the wheel and causing the bike to to flip or something similarly horrible. Um, but no one's ever um, been permanently damaged. No, but it's all been it's it's all been stuff that we've learned from for sure. And you know, thankfully, all the things that have happened have been when there's been in groups of people that were able to stop. You know, we use walkie talkies with all of our different groups, so we know when things are stopped and we can communicate because. Um, you know, we get the whole thing, you know, it's all insured and everything. It's very, very important that the trip is safe. Um, we have it insured and our insurance company actually requires us to, to provide an emergency action plan for every trip, which is what we do and issue it to everyone. So everyone knows where the hospitals are, what the hospital phone numbers are, where all the bike shops are, where are we stopping? Like what's, it's almost like a call sheet for the day um, that we use to kind of organize our trips. And you know, it's it certainly, it's not like a military boot camp, but it's got to be safe. It can't just be craziness. You know, 40 people traveling 50 miles. There's a lot of variation, a lot of things that can kind of go uh, askew in that equation. All right. <clears throat> so trip planning. Um, I personally use um, Ride with GPS, and um, there's a lot of great tools out there. Um, Map My Ride, Strava, all kinds of things. Um, this is no better or worse than any of them. Um, I like 
drive a GPS because I'm used to it. Um, what I'll do is I will, um, when I'm planning a trip, I will enter our starting point and enter the end point in um, the software and kind of like see what it does, right? Like, you know, I know the roads around here pretty well. I, you know, you want to make sure that the, the routing is really optimized for the kind of rides that we want to do. We want to avoid highways. You want to avoid, you know, uh, you know, urban areas potentially, or, and when you do that with Google maps, you know, Google maps certainly has like a, a cycling feature, um, but you know, and it's pretty good. And, and I also do it in Google maps at the same time and kind of compare the two and see like where the disconnects are. I'm like, why would Google maps say, go down the street where Robert GPS says, no, go around the woods and go the other way. So I'll take a very close look. You know, I also um, really try to understand the elevation changes because, you know, as the elevations change, it's kind of like the heartbeat of the trip, you know, certain thing, you know, the, the trip kind of ebbs and flows as you're going up and down elevations. How much total elevation are we gaining? Are we gaining it all at once? You know, invariably on every trip that you do, it's all at the end, it seems, you know, that big hill at the end that you're climbing. So the, again, Ribe GPS is great. It's a, it's a format that's very easily shareable to groups. It's a format that also um, creates um, cue sheets and maps, which are great tools for everyone to have. So again, this is one of many tools out there that does that. Um, local trips, these are just some, you know, some of the trips that we do. Um, you'll see on the screen here, there's just a couple of, uh, of orange stars there. And it's kind of like relative to our area. What I usually do is draw like a 60 mile radius around New York City and, and look for campsites that can accommodate big groups. Um, I think 60 miles um, in terms of newcomers, it, it, that's a long way to go 60 miles up and 60 miles back in a weekend. So, you know, we, we're always, you want to make sure that the person's going to be able to make that. Um, we don't, you know, we don't gauge people's fitness. We don't, we really don't get involved with their bike in any way. Um, but I've, I'm, I've, I mean, the craziest thing I've ever seen was we had a 60 mile trip and a, a kid showed up get a backpack, a fixed gear bike, and flip-flops. And this is the hardest trip that we do that year. And he was great. He wasn't a super, super duper speedy cyclist or anything, but he, I don't think he realized what he was showing up for, but it was fantastic. It was really, really good. Um, so generally our trips are, you know, the 30 to 40 miles, kind of a nice sweet spot. And some of our, I wouldn't say some, I'd say probably more than half of our trips, depending on where we go, a lot of times you can take commuter rail the next morning if you can't, you know, if you don't feel like riding back and want to get on the train and just take the train home. Certainly I've done that. I'm not proud of it, but I've done that if I wanted to get back home sooner. There are a lot of folks that want to take their time and just meander back on a Sunday and enjoy the ride. And that's great. And that's where most people are at. But we, you know, we always have like a safety out for folks that, um, that, um, you know, maybe might not be able to make it all the way back. Um, just some local, some resources, uh, adventures, if you don't know, adventure cycling association, they're fantastic. Um, they have a magazine. It's not for profit. They were, um, organized around the 17, uh, the 1976 centennial, um, in terms of riding across America and they've, uh, they're not for profit. They're a great resource, great magazine, great maps, uh, bikepacking.com. Another great website that has lots and lots of maps and uh, reviews of gear and all kinds of things like that. Um, and also our website, 718c.com travel log, you'll find just a list of every trip we've ever done. And within each one of those, I, I've documented the heck out of images and maps and sketches and videos and how to's and packing lists. So it's all kind of taken care of. Wait, somebody had a question. Within that. Okay. I got a question coming in. It said, would you say the most two day trips are uphill Saturday and downhill <laughs> Sunday? No, it's never, hold on, let me change the video here. So am I, you see me in the video now? Yeah. Um, so the question was, uh, would you, can you repeat the question? Uh, and then you say it again. Um, would you say that most two day trips are uphill Saturday and downhill Sunday? No, it never seems like that. I mean, you know, that's. Repeat the question. So the question was, are most trips uphill on a Saturday, downhill on a Sunday? Um, you know, I guess in a real general sense, I always think about, you know, where we end up in terms of elevation on a Saturday, are we at like plus 1200 feet? And then, you know, coming back, you're obviously coming down that 1200 feet. It never seems that way. Uh, I know it is. I know the, the terrain around New York City certainly starts to ramp up as you head north. So the theory is that coming back, it's, uh, you know, whenever I'm riding up on a, on a hard hill, riding up on a Saturday, 
in my mind, I'm like, oh, it's tomorrow. This is going to be great just to ride down this so fast. But it goes by so fast when you're going, you know, the, the pain on a Saturday doesn't ever seem to equal like what you get on a Sunday, what you get back from it. <clears throat> but um, yeah, we go on trips where everyone has to walk part of it, part of the way. Um, we go on trips that are, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, no one ever forgets the nice flat trips on a sunny, beautiful day. It's always in the rain and the, it's always up a hill and every campsite is at the top of a hill, it seems. And that's my experience <laughs> anyway. Um, any other questions? No, I was gonna really quickly just show you some examples of frame bags and stuff real quick. Let me do that super duper quick. Switch cameras here, look at that. All right, so um, these are just examples of some of the stuff that we use a lot of. This is what I was describing as a Panier. You probably have seen this before. This is a, a single right now, hardware in the back. Very universal in the way that most panniers attach to most racks. Um, these guys are totally waterproof. Uh, this isn't a commercial. This is a panier that we use a lot of. Uh, this is a, a 32 liter set. Uh, most sets are, uh, most panniers are kind of rated by the, uh, the volume across the set. And these are great because you can use these as fronts and rears. You know, as panniers get bigger, harder to use in the front, easier to use as a rear. Oh, wait, we have another question. But these are nice for front and rear. Okay, well, I have another question, so let me answer that question. Uh, has anyone used a recumbent trike or bike on a micro tour? Yeah. Has anyone ever used a recumbent bike or trike on a micro tour? The answer is yes. We have someone use, uh, uh, we have one of our customers you who's. Move over. You can't. My, in the, you're not even I get the wrong, I get the wrong. And the problem is when I'm doing this video, video stuff, I'm the one that's doing the camera. So that's what you need to do next time is do the camera. You can do that, right? Yeah, I can. I can too. Could you? Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, and this is the third time I'll say it, has anyone used a recumbent on our trips? The answer is yes. Uh, I have a great customer and a great friend who's a big recumbent aficionado in the city. He used a two-wheel recumbent um, on a couple of our trips two years ago. And I've had this fantasy personally of using a trike uh, with a trailer on the back. Um, but, uh, you know, getting out of the city on a trike is a little bit of a challenge and um, I haven't really gone the final mile yet. But yes, the answer is yes. I've seen folding bikes. I've seen hybrids. I've seen a guy who has a trailer and carries his 140 pound Great Dane on the back um, on regularly on trips all the time, not just like once. Um, folding bikes. Uh, yeah, um, no electric stuff yet. And the range really isn't there. And that kind of takes that. It's kind of, I don't know, it's cheating, but it's not really taking the fun out of it. So can you change cameras? No. All right. Um, I'm going to talk no, real quick about other frame bags and then uh, any more questions come in. That would be awesome. So um, in terms of this is, this is you know, the idea of a frame bag, right? So this frame bag well, doesn't have any hardware. This is the bag that fits internally within, um, within the bike frame. Um, so you can use you know, panniers and frame bags at the same time. Um, these are nice. This gives you a nice, um, you know, again, you're riding, your legs are on both sides of it. It's not like you can access it while you're riding. But again, when I use these kinds of things, I really like to think about, I like to organize where I put my things and I like to kind of put my things in the same spot in a real general sense every time. Usually on a frame bed like this that's on my frame, I'll have my tools and my cooking stuff because it's kind of heavier. I don't want to hang it off the side of the bike and I want to know where that stuff is very quickly, especially, you know, the tool side of it. You know, the two things I really want to know at any given moment are where are my tools because, you know, if you're jumping off a bike to help someone and also where's the first aid kit? Like, where is my first aid kit? It can't be buried. It can't be at the bottom of a pile. Um, because again, you need to kind of get, break that out and get on that really, really quickly. <clears throat> um, all on the frame bag line, these are real popular too. These are saddle bags. These come from anywhere about eight liters. This is a shorter one to about 17 or 18 liters. And I think these are great. I mean, there's some advantages to having all the weight again on the center line of the bike. You know, some of the disadvantages are, you know, the stuff that's packed down at the bottom, you gotta unpack everything to get to. Um, but these are very popular in a, a frame bag setup. But again, when you're dealing with a rack and a pannier, you know, you can also deal with um and I have another question. When you're dealing with a rack and a pannier, you have you know the surface of the rack itself, right? So I always tell people that that's a great place to put a tent or to put tent poles. Um, just because a tent tends to be a little longer. And generally on the trips that we do, you know, uh, you know, there are bike packing tents that are really tiny. And let me get mine real quick, I'll show you. I can grab it. Ooh. I'll be right back. And I 
So this is a tent, and this is the tent that I use. Um, this is well, this is a new version, but I have the the tent. This is the tent that I use. Big Agnes copper spur. Um, so an entire tent is in here, and it's a a tent for a you know it's a one person tent. Um, nice and tiny, fits on the fork. I can put it in a pannier if I want to. They're not cheap, which is why they're so tiny. The um, generally the the tent and the sleeping bag that people use on some of their first trips tend to be the tent and the sleeping bag that they probably used in college or when they were having campouts when they were kids. Uh, you know, big, bulky, Coleman-style kind of car camping tents. So those tend to be a little bigger for the folks that are doing this for the first time. So, you know, in that case, what I always, you know, tell people to do is you're not going to get your big tent into your pannier. It's going to totally waste, um, waste all that space. You want to get that on, on your rack and kind of maybe bungee it down on the rack is a pretty popular thing. But there's a question. Um, that seems like it could hinder the cables if they're stripped ones, or maybe the cables could wear out on the straps of them. Daniel asked me. Not sure if I get that about the frame bag. Thank you. Oh right, right. So the question, um, <laughs> the question is about you know using frame bags and using you know cables that are routed, and how do you deal with the routing of cables um, that may get in the way of frame bags? And that's a very great point. Um, you know, so you just want to make sure that when you mount these things, you're going to mount them so that the cables can pass freely. Um, and sometimes you simply just can't. Um, on many adventure bikes, you're going to have housing, you know, the cable inside the housing as it passes through, and that's totally fine. On some bikes, the cable will be on the top of the seat tube. Some bikes will be on the underside. But you're very right. If you, if you were mounting this to the underside of um, a bike frame and you had cables passing there, Probably not the greatest idea. You might want to, you can, I've seen people put exposed cables in sheets or get some kind of liner, but generally not a great idea because you, you're totally right and you constrict the movement of your cables for your derailleur and your shifters. But, um, but again, on most of these kinds of bikes, you're generally seeing um, either cables running across the top or full housing all the way through. And in that case, you can kind of do mostly whatever you want. All right. All right, so I don't think I have any more questions. Um, I'm gonna end it by saying, uh, you know, we're a small business, tiny business, it's a one person shop. Uh, 300 square feet, probably smaller than your living room, unless you live in New York City, it's probably bigger than your living room. Um, check out our website, check out our online store, 718c.shop. That's all I'll say about that. I don't wanna make this a commercial or a product offering, but uh, Deb and I love kind of doing these kinds of things and really appreciate you guys joining. Um, email me with any questions. It's right off the website, info at 718c.com. Oh, you didn't have any questions from uh, this week on your... No, I didn't have any questions. The, 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 no, no one submitted a question this week. Oh. All right, well, anyway, thank you very much. I hope this was useful. Um, I hope this was helpful. I'll post this tomorrow. Um, but again, any questions, just email us. You know, there's no, no problems at all. And thank you very much, and have a nice night. So thanks for keeping us sane. Uh, bye. Thank you from Scotty. I think he's across the street. Right? Oh. All right. All right. Awesome. Yeah. That was.